Stanford University. So to get started, um, let's take a look at uh, where solar cells or photovoltaics can be used. Um, and this lecture will be on uh, photovoltaics. I'm not going to look at uh, other ways of um, absorbing sunlight and, and generating electricity. Uh, so, you know, the basic device, as I'm sure you all know, um, has a semiconductor and, and it absorbs light and generates electricity. Uh, roughly a third of the market today is on uh, residential rooftops. Uh, uh, about a third is on uh, commercial rooftops. Um, and as you can imagine, it's, it's easier uh, and cheaper to install there because it's a nice uh, flat uh, uh, roof. Uh, and then about a third are utility scale uh, projects where usually you uh, build a structure on the ground uh, and mount uh, the solar cells. And uh, they each have their advantages. Um, in the residential case, people like it uh, because their choice is to either um, pay roughly 11 cents per kilowatt hour or generate their own power. Um, but utility and commercial have the advantage of being larger scale uh, projects. It's easier to install and um, the, the average permitting costs are going to be lower for, for projects of that size. So um, one of the important questions to ask is how cheap uh, does photovoltaics uh, need to be to compete with coal? And um, it, it, it's a harder question than one might think. There isn't just one answer. Uh, to that question. And uh, I really love this plot. I think it's uh, one of the best answers to the question. On the x-axis, you see the uh, amount of uh, uh, solar energy um, sort of averaged um, over a year. And um, you, know, you see that places like California and Texas and India have more sunlight than, say, places like Norway and, or Sweden and Finland. And so you're going to get more power out uh, for your investment in those places. But of course, we also have to consider the cost of electricity, and that can range, uh, uh, that can vary a lot. In, in China, um, energy is quite cheap. Um, in, in places like Germany and, and, and Denmark, electricity is quite expensive. And uh, here you have the contour lines of uh, what solar would need to cost expressed in dollars per watt uh, peak. In other words, the amount of power you would get. Uh, if you were using the solar cell at noon on a, on a clear day. And so uh, up here in the darker green uh, are, are places where solar only needs to be uh, $6 per watt. And you see that um, when this was created in 2008, um, it was already cheaper to get electricity from solar cells in Italy um, than, than from uh, burning uh, coal. But then as we go down, uh, you need to be at about $4 per watt in California and um, you would need to get below a dollar uh, per watt in China because uh, of electricity um, is so uh, cheap there. And it's even more complicated than that. The, the cost varies during the day. We, people use more electricity uh, during the middle of the day. Um, but it gives you the idea, and, and you see that, um, that the, the lower the cost goes, uh, the more and more um, economic sense it would make to use photovoltaics, the, the demand for it would grow um, as the costs came down. And that's why there isn't one simple answer. Um, but the range in which things get really interesting is at about a few dollars uh, per watt. So um, this is probably one of the most important slides of the whole tutorial. And it shows the total installed system price per watt and how it's come down over the last uh, few years. And this is not just the cost of the module, uh, but also the cost of um, uh, installing it as well. And uh, it was, you know, at about $6 per watt in 2008. And uh, it's come down by a factor of two over the last uh, three years. So it's just been remarkable. And if you think back to that previous slide, it means that the number of places where solar is reaching grid parity uh, has grown enormously over the last uh, few years. Uh, in this slide, you can see the growth of the industry um, over uh, time, and, and you see that it's just growing at a remarkable rate. Um, typical uh, growth in a year is in the 40 uh, to 60 percent range, and there's never really been um, a, a, a bad year um, over the last uh, couple of decades. And uh, so it, it's showing you that more solar has been made in the last year or so um, than all of uh, uh, previous uh, uh, time. The other thing um, to really take out of this plot 
is that it's broken down by uh, region. And you see that now um, more than half of the world's uh, solar cells are made in uh, China. And these are almost all uh, silicon cells. And so uh, really uh, one of the most Im important uh, uh, parts of this whole story is the remarkable uh, uh, growth of the solar industry in China and the cost uh, reductions that have been associated with that. But not everyone um, had a good year, and uh, uh, I think you've probably all heard the um, Solyndra story um, over the last few weeks. It even uh, made the John Stewart show, which is generally not a show that you want to be on. Um, and uh, you know, three companies went bankrupt recently, Solyndra, uh, Spectrowatt, and um, uh, Evergreen uh, Solar. And, um, you know, basically uh, the cost reductions have been so dramatic uh, that companies with business models where they were planning to sell their stuff at a couple dollars per watt, um, they're just not making money now. And um, if they had expanded too fast and can't sell their product, uh, they, they didn't make it. So um, I've been thinking about uh, what is making the industry uh, so fascinating uh, right now. And uh, there are really a lot of reasons. One, photovoltaics address the energy problem, and, and certainly anyone at the Global Climate and Energy Project uh, is passionate about that. And there, there are a lot of people who really want to solve that problem. Uh, we're going to need something like 30 terawatts of power uh, by the year uh, 2050. And uh, some, not everyone, but some people think we could do maybe 20% of that um, with solar. Um, but one thing to keep in mind, that 30 terawatts, that's averaged all the time. And when I say uh, that, that there was, say, 20 um, gigawatts of solar capacity, that would only be at noon. Um, so you would actually need about five times that much uh, to average. So if we were to do all of uh, our power from solar, we would need about 150 terawatts of solar capacity. And so roughly, you know, we would need about 30 terawatts of solar capacity, and at a dollar per watt, that's $30 trillion. Um, that's a big enough prize to uh, draw a lot of people in, and, and there are over 250 uh, solar companies um, right now. Uh, and, and at the moment, the industry is well over 40 billion. It's not a niche anymore. It was five years ago, but 40 billion is a lot, and, and when something's at 40 billion per year, and growing at around 50% per year, um, that attracts quite a lot of attention. But the other thing that makes the story really interesting is that there are a lot of approaches uh, to uh, capturing sunlight and generating electricity, and the experts do not agree, um, and virtually everyone is absolutely positive that the technology they work on is for sure the best, and that everyone else is wasting their time. Uh, which, which makes for a lot of fun. Uh, you know, I'll go over all of these, uh, of course, in more depth later, but uh, you know, the leader right now is crystal and silicon, and, and, and that industry largely um, evolved out of the uh, computer industry, and a lot of people who uh, had developed expertise with silicon were able to transfer that over to solar. Um, but then uh, the, 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 the technologies that are um, probably uh, uh, in the best position uh, to move past silicon or thin films based on things like cadmium telluride and SIGs. Uh, and then there are newer players uh, like organic uh, solar cells. But then you've got a completely different approach. You can make incredibly high quality solar cells that have <coughs> over 40% efficiency. They're outrageously expensive, but you can use concentrators and focus the light down on these very small um, high-performing but expensive cells. And um, probably one of the most important things I can say is that it's pretty easy for any of us to, to, to uh, relatively quickly figure out within a factor of three how good a technology will be. Within a factor of two, that's harder. But nailing it and saying, yeah, it's going to be 70 cents per watt, not 80 cents per watt, not 60, it's going to be 70 cents per watt, that's really tough. And unless you're inside the company and you're building the machines and you know what it costs to run them, it's hard to do that. So I would argue the only people who have enough expertise on any one of these technologies to accurately forecast it 
are so ridiculously biased that you can't really believe anything they say. And so it's really hard uh, to tell uh, which of these technologies are, are, are going to win. And if, if you came to the tutorial hoping that I would tell you uh, which one to invest in, uh, sorry, won't, won't be able to do that. But I am going to tell you even some exciting technologies uh, that are so new that they're, they're not on the slide that John Benner uh, gave me uh, from Enro. Um, and here, um, this is a popular plot. Um, NREL tracks the world records and, and constantly updates this plot. And it, it, it shows you all of the, the different technologies. And, uh, but one thing I want to highlight that you didn't see in the previous graph, if you look in 2011, virtually every technology got a world record. Multi-junction is at 43.5. Uh, gallium arsenide got a world record, um, CADTEL got one, SIGS got one last year, Organic got one. All the technologies are having a really good year. There are even more factors that make uh, the plot um, interesting. As you all know, the, the, um, the, the, go the global economy has been extremely turbulent over the last few years. Crazy things have happened. Um, people could be all excited about a project and then suddenly the financing can disappear. Government policies are constantly uh, changing. Italy recently, um, because of their economic problems, had to pull back on some of the subsidies uh, for solar. And then another thing, you know, when a manufacturing-based industry grows at 40% per year, in spurts and in a somewhat unpredictable way, it's very hard on the supply chain. And a few years ago, uh, there, there wasn't enough silicon. Um, had, had people known how the industry would have grown, they could have made enough, but they didn't. Then, uh, because the price shot up, lots of factories got built. Then there were too many. Then the price of silicon went down. And so, you know, we're seeing a lot of wiggles, lots of rapid up and ups and downs. Um, I think we're going to see problems with the supply of tellurium um, and indium for some of the uh, thin film technologies. And one of the points I want to make here, um, here we're at a university and I think we're trying to think long term. Um, you don't want to look, you don't want to go in the newspaper and, and look at the cost, um, or I should say the price of a technology right now, because it doesn't really reflect the cost. It's what they could sell it for. And if a company has a bunch of cells in their warehouse and they need to get rid of them, um, they're going to sell them at a sale price. Doesn't, that doesn't mean that they could go to the terawatt scale um, at that price, and we have to keep that in mind. So all of these factors uh, make the solar um, industry really fascinating. OK, now for some of the uh, science. Uh, almost all uh, solar cells are based on a uh, PN junction. Uh, and uh, when, you, when you bring a P-type semiconductor uh, into contact with an N-type, some of the holes from the p-type will diffuse over to the n-type. Some of the electrons from the n-type will diffuse over uh, to the p-type. And uh, the, that built-up charge will generate an electric field. And uh, that will uh, bend uh, the energy bands in the semiconductor. And then when light is absorbed, uh, electrons uh, can be pulled by that field to one side, and holes can be pulled to the other. And we can generate both a voltage um, and a, a current. Um, and it, another very important point is that frequently the light will be absorbed outside of that junction. Um, and there's no field there, but carriers can often diffuse to the junction and still uh, be pulled out. Uh, typically, you need high quality material for that to happen. If there are defects, impurities, um, grain boundaries, the carriers might get stuck and recombine. They may not make it over there. Um, and so that's why uh, you'll, you'll usually see the really high performance with high quality single crystals of things like uh, silicon or uh, gallium arsenide. An important part of a tutorial on anything related to energy is to talk about the <coughs> theoretical limits. And uh, here you, you, you certainly cannot uh, convert all of the uh, solar energy into electricity. And um, probably the, the, the biggest problem is that uh, photons can only be absorbed if their energy exceeds the energy of the, the band gap. And the sun uh, has a, um, a broad uh, a spectrum. And so all those photons with energy less than the band gap don't even get absorbed. 
Now we could try to fix that problem by using a small band gap, but then the other side of it is that when carriers are excited up into the bands, they very rapidly relax to the bottom of the band and all that energy is given off as heat. And so the voltage we can ultimately generate depends on the band gap and to get a high voltage, we need a high band gap. So you have the trade-off between being able to absorb light and being able to generate a high voltage. And uh, here you see the efficiency you can get um, as a function of the band gap. And uh, the best you can do is about 31%. And uh, th that's when you have a band gap of 1.4 uh, electron volts. And, and materials that have that band gap are things like gallium arsenide and um, uh, cadmium telluride. Now, there are ways uh, to get around that. And um, the one that works by far the best is to use uh, multi-junction solar cells. Um, here the idea is you're gonna stack uh, solar cells on top of each other and they'll have different band gaps. And you want the light to go through the high band gap material first so you can absorb the highest energy photons and that cell can generate a high voltage and it won't waste a lot of um, energy. The lower energy photons will go right through and then the, um, uh, a cell with an intermediate um, uh, band gap can uh, uh, generate um, a medium sized voltage and then the lowest energy photons can go down um, into a lower band gap uh, material. And, and these can be in series and the voltages will add just like when you uh, take three uh, batteries and, and connect them in series. Uh, historically, uh, people used germanium, uh, but then very recently, uh, uh, Jim Harris uh, uh, formed a startup company uh, called Solar Junction and uh, used a material, uh, Gainus, a gallium indium nitrium, uh, nitrogen arsenide that um, has a better band gap than germanium uh, because it's uh, a little bit higher. Uh, they can generate a higher uh, voltage. And uh, that has led uh, to a recent uh, world record of 43.5%. Uh, um, and if you, uh, if you make solar cells a little bit um, and you see that IV curve, you just like wanna worship that. It's uh, uh, pretty, pretty amazing. A few, few volts, very high fill factor, amazing current. But I guess it's all summed up by that number, 43.5% uh, uh, efficiency, which is just uh, remarkable. Okay, so we'll go through all of these technologies now. Uh, I think we have to start with silicon uh, because silicon uh, has 87% uh, of the uh, market uh, right now. Um, silicon uh, is, is made by taking uh, a pretty high quality uh, uh, silicon feedstock um, and making uh, uh, big single crystals. Uh, and then those crystals are sliced and uh, polished. Uh, and then um, uh, the top of it is doped to make the PN junction. Um, the uh, surfaces are passivated, electrodes are put on, and then eventually uh, modules are made. And uh, we wish I could say more about each of these technologies, but really can only have a few slides for, for each one. Uh, some of the things that have been happening to make silicon better uh, now you don't have an electrode everywhere on the back. You just have the electrode in places, and in the other places you passivate the surface with silicon oxide. Uh, that gets rid of some of the dangling bonds that could lead to recombination. Uh, up on the top you can see that the uh, surface is textured, and uh, that takes the light and scatters it into the cell and increases the path length, uh, makes it possible to absorb more light. Uh, there's an anti-reflection coating that keeps the light uh, from being reflected. Uh, people are starting to ion implant uh, the phosphorus in instead of diffusing it in. Uh, they're, they're working on the contacts here. They're making the, um, uh, the, the, the silver lines on top thinner and taller because uh, you know, light can't get through that, so you want to make those electrodes as thin as you possibly can. Uh, for cost, the, the uh, wafers are being made thinner and thinner. You know, the challenge, though, is as they get thinner, it's harder to handle them. But all these things are being done, and every year the cells are getting better. Um, the, the, and, and the gap between what they can manufacture and uh, the world record that one can get in a lab, you know, is getting smaller and uh, uh, smaller. 
And uh, you know, the, the industry is doing incredibly well. The prices have dropped faster than anyone thought. But I, I also want to caution that it's not clear that silicon is always going to be the best technology. And there are some artificial things that have brought the cost down. And uh, I think we've all known that the, the environmental regulations were much lower in China. And now the Chinese people are uh, standing up to that. And, and you know, just a couple of weeks ago, uh, there was a huge protest at one of China's um, largest uh, solar plants because all the fish were dying in the um, river nearby. Um, and I predict that with time, you know, China will clean up its industries um, the way we have in this country. And that's not going to be done for free. We, you know, the costs will, will go up somewhat um, when, when that's done. But another really important part of this story, um, these are the loans um, that Chinese solar, sump, uh, solar companies have received, and they total $40 billion. Um, and you have to know that these companies are not making money. They are selling the modules um, at far less than it's costing them to make it. And of course, they're, they're trying to shut out um, all the high-tech companies that are here in the valley. And if, if they can weather this and, and put these companies out of business, um, then, then they will have control of a market that is someday going to be worth far more than uh, $40 billion uh, uh, per year. So kind of my takeaways is that um, the, the modules are being sold at a dollar per watt now, but not for profit. Um, I have absolutely no doubt that in the near future, um, they, they will be uh, manufactured at a cost of a dollar per watt, but I don't know about 50 cent per watt. Um, and I, I do believe that the ultimate winner will be down in the 30 to 50 cent uh, per watt range. So not saying they can't do it, I'm just saying it's not clear yet that they will go uh, below 50 cent per watt. So now let's um, uh, look at the technology that's in the best position uh, to move past silicon, and, and one might argue that First Solar um, already has. Uh, First Solar has the lowest uh, cost per watt of any company right now. Uh, so the whole idea behind thin film solar is now instead of using this whole wafer of high quality uh, material, silicon or gallium arsenide, we're just going to deposit a thin film on preferably a low cost substrate, glass, plastic, maybe aluminum foil, stainless steel foil. And uh, used to think of conventional techniques like evaporating or sputtering, um, but now we're seeing um, potentially even lower cost techniques like printing. Uh, the, the thin films. So now you're going to use um, a lot less material and um, thin films um, can be flexible. Um, some of the substrates are, are, are flexible. That means you can make it in a roll-to-roll -roll coater and potentially uh, the installation costs are going to be lower for a flexible product. You could build it right into roofing material, for example. Um, so this is uh, a cadmium telluride cell. Um, you uh, have glass with a transparent oxide. Uh, the n-type semiconductor is cadmium sulfide. The p-type and the absorber is cadmium telluride. The cad sulfide is um, very thin. You actually don't want it to absorb light um, because the recombination is very high in that layer, um, but, but it does absorb some light. It has a band gap of 2.4 eV. So uh, the cells tend not to work very well for the highest energy uh, uh, photons. Uh, one of the things um, that's, uh, or I should say the world record is 17.3%. Uh, uh, and one of the things that makes this really, really exciting is that you can evaporate uh, cadmium telluride and the two elements come off at the same ratio. With some materials, you go to evaporate them and, and one has a much higher vapor pressure than the other and you don't end up with the ratio you want in the film. But it's very easy with cadmium telluride to get that ratio and uh, the deposition rates can be incredibly uh, fast. Um, and so that's, I, I think, um, that and the simplicity of a system that only has two elements in it um, has allowed First Solar to be one of the most successful arguably the most successful solar companies um, in, in the world. Um, it only takes uh, First Solar 2.5 hours um, to make modules, and the ones they sell now are um, over 11% um, efficiency. Uh, you can see here the, the remarkable uh, uh, growth 
um, of the company. It's had some recent years where it uh, doubled um, its uh, capacity. And on the right, you can see uh, really dramatic uh, cost reductions. And uh, as of last year, they were at uh, 77 uh, cents per watt, which is, to the best of my knowledge, uh, the, the, the best of um, any technology that is out there right now. Um, just want to give you a, a sense of why their modules are at 11 percent um, and not the world record of 17.3. Uh, part of it is as you go to a large module, you've got to pull the current out and um, you're going to have some ohmic losses that you don't have in a small cell. Uh, part of it is that when you do things slowly and carefully um, in an academic-like setting, you can always do better than when you're doing things rapidly um, in, a, in a factory. Um, and then there are other things like that cadmium sulfide window. If you make it 10 nanometers thick, you can avoid the um, absorption I was telling you about. But when you try to manufacture a layer that's 10 nanometers, and if a pinhole in that layer would short the device out, you're going to have a hard time. And so the thicker you make that layer, the higher your yield is going to be. Um, but it's, you know, it's not impossible. The, the silicon industry has like one or two nanometer thick gates. Um, so I, with time, I think we'll, we'll see improvements and, and we'll, see, we'll see that gap close and we're also going to see that world record uh, climb. Uh, there's no reason why it couldn't be higher than 17.3%. Uh, there are some potential um, uh, problems uh, with cadmium telluride. A lot of people ask me, um, if it's okay to use cadmium, which is toxic. Uh, of course, First Solar thinks that it's a manageable problem, and, and I tend to agree with them. I, I think it is safely packaged in the cell. Uh, it's not like we're making drinking cups out of it. Um, probably the bigger concern is more at the factory and uh, making sure that everything gets disposed of properly in the, in the manufacturing uh, uh, process. Um, and I'm gonna come back to the subject of do we have enough tellurium uh, in a little while. So the, the, the next really important thin film technology is um, SIGs. And uh, a lot of people think it's gonna, um, it's gonna push cadmium telluride out. And, and their argument for that would be that the world record efficiency is 20.4. So um, it's three points um, uh, better than uh, cadmium telluride. And that's, that's really uh, quite important. You're going to get a lot more power um, uh, from a SIGS uh, module. Um, many, many companies are working on it. It's more popular, I'd say, than cadmium uh, telluride. Uh, they're depositing it in almost every way uh, you can possibly um, imagine. And a few companies are starting to manufacture you know, about 30 to 50 megawatts um, uh, per year. It wouldn't surprise me if someone might be at 100 um, by now. And uh, you know, they've, they've been right on the verge of, uh, uh, you know, they've, they've said for many years that they were gonna you know, take over the industry and they haven't done it yet. And I think the problem is that it's really hard to handle all four elements and to get the right ratio. Um, they've just had a hard time keeping the yields of the factories um, high. And you also gotta realize it's not a four element system. There's also cadmium and sulfur, that's five and six. You get some oxygen in there, that's seven, and it's well known that you need a little bit of sodium as well, and that's the eighth element. Um, and that gives you a real headache when you start thinking about the material science of a film that has eight elements, and they do mix. Um, when you anneal these cells, you do have interdiffusion uh, between the layers, so it is a complicated uh, uh, system. So uh, let me say a little bit about a few companies. Um, the, the company that's been getting a lot of attention, unfortunately not good attention um, lately, has been Solyndra. And uh, you know, now it's very easy for, for people to uh, uh, give that company a hard time. I, I heard a speaker last week said that they had absolutely no technology whatsoever. Uh, that's being a little harsh, I think. Um, I think their module design is actually uh, pretty, pretty cool. Um, but like a, a, a lot of um, ideas that seem good at first, ultimately it's probably not the best idea. Uh, but, but the design they had that, that no one else had, to the best of my knowledge, is to make the solar cells on a cylinder. And some of the good things are that 
it, it, it basically naturally tracks the sun. As the sun moves through the sky during the day, um, it's, it's always going to pick it up. Um, you can pick some reflected light um, up off of a white uh, roof, uh, so that's kind of nice. When you go to seal it, um, you, you put an outer tube around it, and then you put a metal cap on the end. It's a lot easier to seal that uh, than it is to seal um, a big flat uh, uh, plate. And they made the argument that the technology was already well developed. We have you know, billions of, of fluorescent light tubes, and they argued that they were going to piggyback off of that um, industry. Um, but then they argued that they can cover uh, roofs um, a whole lot better with their technology than, than other cells, um, though I don't think this is exactly a fair comparison. I think that uh, if you ask me to cover this roof with as many solar cells as possible, I could probably lift them up um, over that pipe uh, that, that we see there. Um, but then their cells do a lot better in wind. Wind can go in between their tubes, whereas when you put a big um, planar solar cell on, uh, wind can rip those things right off the roof. So you have, to, you have to secure them really well to the roof, and that costs money. Cylindra cells, um, you just place them down. You, you, you don't have any mechanical attachment uh, to the roof. And so the installation costs would be a lot lower. Uh, Cylindra was saying that um, it would be in your best interest to pay up to 80 cent per watt more for their product uh, because of the savings you would have in the installation costs. Furthermore, uh, their cells don't get as hot because of airflow and uh, the performance of solar cells drop as they get warmer. So there were a lot of advantages, um, but there were a lot of reasons not uh, to go with that approach. Um, when you're using a cylinder instead of a flat cell, you just have more area. There's more semiconductor and therefore more cost. Uh, you also uh, you have more dark current. Um, you have recombination on the back side of the cell that's not uh, picking up sunlight, and that's going to bring your uh, voltage um, down. Um, uh, a couple of years ago, uh, the CEO of Nanosolar, Martin Roshisen, uh, wrote a really nice blog on all the reasons um, why a cylinder was not the right design and concluded that if it was, since Nanosolar makes flexible solar cells, they would wrap them around the tube, but they're not going to do that because it's not uh, the way to go. But I've asked a lot of people, I, I've toured the factory at Cylindra, um, and I've asked a lot of people around the valley um, who have employed a lot of Solyndra's former employees and asked, you know, deeper, what went wrong? Um, you know, the whole thing about the cylinders being cheap, that was a little misleading. These are not the same glass tubes that are used in fluorescent light bulbs. You're putting um, SIGs on there and, and annealing this at like 600 degrees. So, you know, this is really high quality glass. And then, uh, you know, Solyndra was built by a lot of really good people who had left applied materials. These guys loved custom building equipment, and that is what they did. Uh, the factory was unbelievable, um, really a pleasure to see, but it had to be expensive uh, to build all of that equipment. And um, other companies are trying to buy equipment that was designed for other purposes, and they get it at a, at a lower cost. Um, but uh, when I talk to people um, at, at, at Solyndra, they say that basically it's just the, it's what happened with silicon. The prices just dropped too fast, and uh, with companies in China selling at a dollar per watt, uh, Solyndra um, just couldn't couldn't stay afloat. And it's interesting, you know, the outrage we have in the United States over a five hundred million dollar loan compared to the forty billion dollar loan um, in, in China. Um, but I think you know, in hindsight, we can all agree. It was not the right time to build a second factory, um, and that is what Solyndra um, did with the government loan. So um, moving on to another uh, SIGS company, uh, Nanosolar uh, uh, has the approach of uh, printing uh, the material. They print uh, uh, particles. Um, can't say what, uh, what, what exactly what composition those particles have, but they print them and fuse them, and remarkably, you can end up, after you anneal this, with a film 
that is very similar to what you might get by evaporation or sputtering. It no longer resembles uh, a film of um, uh, printed uh, nanoparticles. Uh, and they can do over 16% uh, uh, cells uh, with, with this printing process. Um, here you can uh, see uh, huge rolls of aluminum foil uh, going into their roll-to-roll uh, -roll coater. And so basically their position is that they can achieve uh, very low cost. They, they, they hope to go below 50 cent per watt uh, by printing these cells at a very uh, fast uh, rate. Um, one of the things that's, um, I think, really uh, neat about their technology and that I would not have expected several years back is um, they, uh, they have an have a interesting way of collecting the current. They use um, a very thin transparent conductor on the top and then they have all these metal fingers that take the current, drop it down through a via, um, and into a backfoil. So they have two metal foils, uh, one for the higher um, potential, one for the lower uh, potential. And these have excellent uh, uh, conductivity, um, and they're able to pull the current out very efficiently. And usually in a thin film cell, you wire the cells up in series. Um, but here they build uh, uh, individual six by six inch solar cells and with robots uh, place them in uh, to, to make uh, panels. So it was not the um, conventional way of making thin film uh, solar cells. And then another company that I'm very excited about is Mia Soleil. Uh, I got to spend about 20 hours uh, touring their factory and evaluating them for an investor last year and you know, can't share most of what I saw. Um, but uh, I can say that they sputter uh, SIGs and, and they, they do it on a uh, steel foil in a roll-to-roll -roll, uh, coating machine. Um, they have made 15.7% efficient uh, modules and that is verified by NREL. The back end where they uh, make the modules is fully automated and I've been back there and seen all of the robots uh, uh, doing this. And I would expect pretty soon that they'll be shipping 13.5% modules at around 80 cent uh, per watt. Um, and that's going to be very competitive with First Solar uh, because their modules are at about 11. Um, so they'll uh, be about matching the cost, um, but with higher efficiency, uh, the installation costs will be lower because not as many panels uh, will, will need to be uh, put in. So I'm, I'm fairly optimistic um, that SIGS is finally going to do well over the next few years. But there is an issue that in the long term could really affect both cadmium telluride and SIGs, and that is uh, that tellurium is a rare element and indium is a rare element. And in the interest of time, I'm just going to do a few slides on tellurium, but the numbers come out to be very similar uh, for indium. And at the end, I have some papers you can read um, that will go through both cases in more depth. And you, know, you can just do very simple calculations and show that you need about 5.7 grams of tellurium uh, per meter squared. And um, uh, sorry, with 10% um, with efficient, and, and I know now they can, they can do 11, but you'd get about 16 watts of power uh, per gram of tellurium. And you can go on the United States uh, Geological Survey website and find out that the world reserve of tellurium is about 47,000 tons. And if you used all of it, which is not really that feasible, but if you did, um, you could only uh, uh, generate about 0.14 terawatts of uh, power with uh, cadmium telluride. And, you know, I'm a big dreamer and I'd like to see solar, you know, do five terawatts or so. Um, and, and, and so it would be hard with the known reserve of tellurium. Um, however, there are some things to keep in mind. Uh, uh, a lot of people make the point that we always have about a 30-year supply of every element because when we have a 30-year supply, we stop looking. We say we have enough. So there may be more out there. And another thing to keep in mind, if the price doubles, the um, United States Geological Survey would immediately raise that number because then it would be economically uh, worthwhile to extract tellurium from places where it's currently um, not available. It's just like when the price of oil goes up, um, the tar sands in Canada suddenly um, <coughs> become a good uh, source of oil. 
Um, but if you look at the cost of tellurium, um, and I'm sorry, this isn't quite up to date, uh, it's about a penny and a half uh, per watt. And you know, for solar, the, the overall module, it's, it's about 80 cent uh, per watt. So it's a couple percent. And that means the cost, you know, it can double, it can triple, maybe even go up by a factor of five before it becomes a really serious problem. So there is some room for the price to go up a bit and encourage the mining industry uh, to get more uh, tellurium. Um, sometimes people will say, well, we'll just go find more tellurium. It's not quite that simple. Um, there's probably not a mother load of tellurium. It's diffuse in the rock and uh, it's a byproduct of copper mining. You, there's no such thing as a tellurium mine. Um, almost all of the income for the mine comes from the copper and then you, um, you extract the tellurium you can. So if you say I need twice as much tellurium, you can't go and, and mine twice as much rock um, to go get it. But as the price goes up, um, you can certainly make sure that all of the copper plants have the equipment to get the tellurium and you can do um, uh, everything possible to make that extraction process uh, more efficient. And so I think, you know, I think I'm gonna leave it at that. It's a complicated subject. Um, there's some papers down here where you could read a bit more about the tellurium and indium um, issue. Um, but for, uh, for my thinking, uh, certainly as academics looking at the long term, um, we can't just say, you know, first solar is great, problem solved, no need to work on anything else. I, I think we have to um, look for alternatives. Uh, and if you look through the periodic table um, you can, and look at, at, at the availability of some of the elements, um, it turns out there are some good ones for solar. And one that has really picked up interest in the last few years is copper zinc tin sulfide or CZTS. It is extremely similar uh, to SIGS, uh, which we know can yield 20.4% uh, uh, efficiency. Uh, Bruce Clemens and Stacy Bent work in this area at Stanford. And uh, here in, in blue, you see the efficiency slowly evolving over time in Japan. And then a couple of years ago, interest really picked up IBM uh, got 9.6% efficiency, and then uh, the Clemens Group um, had a remarkable year. If they can, uh, if they can maintain this uh, rate of um, improvement, uh, they'll have the energy problem solved in the next couple of uh, years. Uh, so they're at 9.3% and rising fast. And uh, here you can see the number of papers over time. There really was no field of research on CZTS until just a couple of years ago. Now we're seeing about 35 uh, uh, papers uh, per year. <coughs> so then there's a, another approach, and this is what I personally uh, do research on. Uh, one can make thin films of uh, molecules. Um, these can be sprayed in a roll-to-roll -roll coater. And um, this is an example of a module uh, made by a startup company uh, called Canarca. And um, you see that it's on, it's plastic, it's highly flexible, um, opens up some interesting opportunities for how you might use the modules. Um, here you can deposit it much faster um, than say Mia Sole sputters their um, SIGs. I mean, you just spray it, done. It's a lot more like printing a newspaper. Um, there's no rare element, no tellurium, no indium, uh, nothing in here is um, uh, toxic. You can very easily make tandems. Um, you can you know, build a cell and then spray another one on top of it. And no reason to go all organic. Um, you can take a silicon module and spray a high band gap um, organic cell on top of it. And now um, the only additional cost is the materials and the spraying. There's no extra substrate, no extra packaging. Um, you just go to the tandem architecture and potentially you get a higher um, efficiency, no extra installation costs. So that could be uh, you know, really exciting. These cells are totally different from conventional solar cells. There is no PN junction. Instead, there's a donor material and, and an electron acceptor. Um, the donor is usually a polymer. The acceptor is usually a fullerene derivative. You uh, spray these materials and they naturally phase separate at the nanometer length scale. When uh, one material absorbs light, you get a, an exciton or a bound electron hole pair. It goes to the interface. 
uh, and then the acceptor takes the electrons to one electrode and the donor uh, takes them uh, to the other. Uh, the improvements in recent years have, have, have been really substantial. Uh, in, in, in just the last few years, it's gone from five to uh, NREL confirmed 8.3. Uh, Mitsubishi is saying they have over uh, 10%. Um, and so it's still the early days of organic um, and, and unclear where it can ultimately go. Um, if I had more time, I would show you uh, things that I think will take the efficiency uh, to over 15%. Uh, just some of the things that people are doing, they're, they're tuning the chemistry, um, they're getting the right band gap, um, they're reducing uh, the amount of energy that is lost when the electron goes from the donor to the acceptor, uh, they're, they're getting the morphology of the film right so that the electrons and holes don't recombine. And again, I think there's a lot of room for improvement and, and we see a path to 15% efficiency. The biggest concern um, that I think most people have with this technology is uh, whether or not it could last for, for 20, 30 um, years. And uh, the, probably the, the biggest issue is that when molecules are in the excited state, um, even if there's just tiny amounts of oxygen present, um, there can be a, a photo oxidation and the damaged molecule can act as a, a trap uh, for the carriers and that will lead to recombination. Um, so one thing I would say is that we're definitely going to have to encapsulate um, these solar cells. You know, they're going to have to be packaged, but all solar cells have to be uh, packaged. I think a UV filter would help enormously, uh, something that would block the highest energy photons and, you know, glass or a little bit of titania um, can, can do that. And then I would say that um, just because you throw a newspaper out in sunlight and watch the colors fade, it doesn't mean all molecules degrade fast, and there are, for example, car paints um, that are extremely uh, stable in, in sunlight. And uh, here, are, these are solar cells made by Heliotech, and uh, they do extrapolated testing with um, more than one sun of light intensity, and, uh, and, and, and they extrapolate that these cells would last about uh, 40 years, and they have an efficiency around 6.5%, so a pretty good combination of efficiency um, and lifetime, and I think this shows that there are molecules um, that, that, that are sufficiently uh, durable. And uh, by the way, I should say these slides are on my website and you have the handouts, and so here's some, uh, if anyone wants to read more, here, here are some review articles to go to. Okay, so the, um, we, we've just looked at what would potentially be one of the cheapest cells to manufacture. Now let's go all the way to the other end and, and, and you know, let's, let's look at the, uh, the Lamborghini, uh, the cells that can do 43.5% uh, uh, efficiency. These are the multi-junction uh, cells. And you know, I want you to see, we're, I, we don't have time to, to go through what every layer does, but I want you to see how complicated this cell is. Um, and, and this is grown on a single crystal substrate. Uh, typically one uses molecular beam epitaxy or um, uh, metalloorganic uh, chemical vapor deposition uh, to grow this up um, one uh, monolayer at a time. Um, it's a very slow, expensive, and careful uh, uh, process. And uh, you know, right now, um, you can buy 37% uh, uh, cells, but they cost $50,000 uh, per meter squared. Um, you know, compared to the first solar, you know, they're down, I forget the exact number, but they're between 100 and 200 uh, uh, per uh, meter squared. Uh, so clearly, you're not going to be covering your, your roof with this anytime soon. Um, uh, to use it, uh, you, you've got to use small cells and you've got to concentrate uh, the, the light. And so I need to say a little bit about um, uh, concentrators. Um, there are various approaches. Sometimes you see one huge concentrator. Uh, Sole Focus um, uses an array of uh, uh, smaller uh, concentrators, and I, I think it's a little bit easier uh, to make sure the light always hits the solar cell uh, when you do that, and the, the heating is not nearly as much of an issue. Um, over here, the heating can be um, uh, rather enormous with such a large uh, concentrator. Uh, you, you have to track the sun um, when you do this. The, the, the um, collector needs to be pointed right at the sun for the light to focus in. 
Um, I really like um, this plot. There's a few nice points to be made here. Um, you can see what you would get from a fixed flat panel, for example, a cadmium telluride cell in Seattle and Albuquerque. First thing I find interesting is, um, you know, you don't get an order of magnitude more sun in, in, in Albuquerque. I mean, it seems like it rains all the time in Seattle, but you know, it's, it's only, only a factor of two uh, difference between, uh, between them. If you track those cells, you see how much better, and you know, roughly you'll do about 30% better if your solar cell is always pointed uh, towards the, the sun. Uh, so you have to decide if the cost of tracking is worth 30%, and I think most people feel the answer to that question is no. Um, and then you see what you would get um, with a two-axis concentrated PV, and it's, it's not the same as you'd get on a flat panel, and the reason is that, and it depends where you are, but like 20 to 40% of the light is diffuse. You know, all the blue light you see from the sky, that's not coming straight from the sun, and that light isn't gonna focus onto your solar cells, so you won't get that. Um, when you use concentrated um, uh, PV. And that, that's something that really needs to be kept in mind. And what you see is in Seattle, this makes no sense um, at all. You have a lot of diffuse light and it's just not gonna work um, in Seattle to use concentrators. This is only for sunny places. The other is um, uh, your neighbors are probably not gonna let you put um, a huge solar cell on your roof um, with, with tracking. So this is probably more out in the uh, desert. And here we go through some cost estimates that um, uh, Steve Eglash uh, and I have been thinking about. And uh, you know, just some rough numbers. I can't say for sure that all of these numbers are, are exactly uh, right. But um, if you have 500x concentration, then you bring the cost of solar down to about 100 per meter squared. And that, but that's, that's just for the solar cell part. It, the tracker and concentrators looks like a reasonable number might be about $200 per meter squared. The sun gives us about um, uh, 1,000 watts per meter squared, but we're only going to get about 850, and that might even be a little bit generous because we're not going to get uh, the diffuse components. So that's a correction that the other technologies don't have to, to make. Um, and then you know, these cells are going to get really hot so you're not gonna get the 37%, that might come down to about uh, 30%. So you, know, you run all these numbers and, and you know, you get, maybe you could get to $1.50 per watt, but silicon's already there. You know, CAD tell, they're, 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 they're at 80 cents per watt. Um, so this, this approach um, you know, really faces some stiff challenges to get to where it needs to be. Yeah. Are there, excuse me, are there accelerated temperature, time temperature studies that even suggest that those panels will last as long because of the elevated temperature? So the, the question is, um, would the cells last at the elevated temperature? And, um, How would that affect the numbers? I, 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 I don't know the answer to that question. It is a pretty robust technology, though, but I, I, I can't say for sure. So uh, this is a really popular plot. I think I've seen it um, at least 100 times at, at various conferences. Um, at least eight years ago, Martin Green uh, came up with the generations of solar technology, uh, the first one being uh, single crystals, silicon, gallium arsenide, the second being thin film, and the third being anything that has some trick um, to beat that 31% limit, which is often called the shockley Kweiser. Uh, uh, limit. And then over here you have the cost in dollars per meter squared on one axis and the efficiency on the other. And you know, as the cost goes up, if the efficiency goes up too, you have a constant dollar per watt. So you have all these lines uh, of, of, of constant dollar per watt. And uh, you see the, 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 the different uh, uh, generations. And uh, you know, obviously, uh, you look at this, and 20 cent per watt is the best, and, and uh, I always see this as a justification for generation three um, technology, which is what a lot of academics love to, to work on. Um, but let's be realistic here. Um, remember, I, the cost is $50,000 per meter squared. 
the, the actual data point is out in the parking lot somewhere. Um, now, yeah, if you use the concentrators, um, you maybe pull it over, but still your, your bottom line is it's, it's right now nowhere near as good. So of course, this is the classic game of um, showing where the conventional technologies are and where the future technology will be in our wildest um, dreams. And, and certainly uh, the top of that oval with 80% efficiency at a cost of $100 per meter squared um, is a pretty wildly um, optimistic uh, 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 dream. Um, and uh, y you'll often hear people who work on the highest efficiency technologies say that um, because of the installation costs, you absolutely you know, got to have the high efficiency. And there's some truth to that. I, I personally don't believe that 10% uh, efficient technologies have any future. I think um, ultimately, uh, you know, 10 years from now, everything will be at 15% or higher. I'm not totally convinced that we have to be over 20%. And I think sometimes the installation costs are overstated. Um, and, you know, it doesn't cost that much extra for a crew to put in um, 15 cells instead of 10. A lot of the cost is simply dry getting the permit, driving out there, you know, setting up, getting up on the roof. It really doesn't take that much longer to put five more panels. Yes, you need more mounts, um, but a lot of the costs do not um, scale with the number or with the area of the uh, solar cells. The substrates do, the packaging does. So I'm not, I'm not completely disagreeing. We, we do want high efficiency. Um, it just might not be quite as essential as some people claim. Uh, a, a company that is uh, currently generating uh, perhaps the most attention in the, the valley is um, Alta Devices. Uh, they recently set a world record for gallium arsenide at 28.2%. Um, uh, and uh, what's really uh, novel and exciting here is that they uh, deposit the cell uh, on, on gallium arsenide. They, they grow a stack with the, um, you know, the P, the N type layers. Um, and then they have a layer of aluminum arsenide and they're able to etch that out. There are etches that um, will remove aluminum arsenide but they won't touch gallium arsenide. And so they can just take take that right off of there and then put it on a flexible substrate. And so now, and they, they, it's really thin, only a couple microns of gallium arsenide. So they now have um, a flexible cell um, uh, and they can reuse the wafer. And so now they're, they're not using a lot of uh, material. And so I don't, I don't know what Martin Green would call this. Um, I don't know if it's, it's first, second or third generation. Uh, it's single crystal, that makes it first. It's thin film, that makes it second. And it's way better than anything we had before. Uh, and that, that almost makes it third. Um, but uh, I guess it's not important what we call it. What's important is that uh, it, uh, it generates a very um, high efficiency. Um, and, and here you can see the old record and the new record. Um, they, they get a higher voltage. They get about 10% <laughs> um, higher voltage. And, and even since this was made, they, they, they've done um, even a little bit uh, better. There's actually new physics here. And uh, Eli Yablonovich um, has, a, has, a, has a paper um, explaining this. And uh, it turns out having the whole wafer is a bad thing because um, uh, electrons and holes can recombine, give off light, and the light can go deep down into the wafer and then be reabsorbed, uh, but you're not able to collect carriers from down there. If you have a thin film, that light will be reflected and basically trapped in there, and then it can be reabsorbed and the photon gets recycled, um, and that's, you can actually do better um, with a thin film of gallium arsenide than you can do um, with a, a, a wafer. So that's a really nice bonus, I, I think. Certainly the main motivation was to peel off so that you could reuse the wafer, um, but they ended up um, with, with higher efficiency at the same time. Uh, people are doing this with silicon um, as well. Um, uh, Astrowad is, is peeling it off. Uh, I know Twin Creeks um, does this. A number of academic labs are coming up with ways of um, uh, peeling silicon off. And uh, so potentially this, this is a way uh, with silicon or gallium arsenide 
to uh, go over 20%, um, but also uh, get the low cost that you think of um, as being associated uh, with thin films. Um, you know, last week, um, Eli Yablonovich was here for the energy seminar and um, had some pretty bold things uh, to say about how exciting this technology is. Um, said that depositing it would, would basically be so cheap that it's free. Um, I, I'm having a hard time understanding um, how the deposition of uh, high quality 3.5 semiconductors has become free. Uh, granted, the multi-junction cells had a few more layers, but that was $50,000 per meter squared. So we need quite a bit more than a factor of 10 cost reduction. That $50,000 per meter squared did not come entirely from the cost of the wafer um, that things were, were, were grown off of. Um, so it's not clear to me that that deposition can be done at low cost. Not clear to me that this peeling process um, is, you know, is, is going to be fully compatible with low cost manufacturing. With silicon, it's even trickier. You don't have that easy aluminum arsenide um, undercut. Um, and it's not clear to me that Alta is going to be able to reuse the wafer, I think they say, 30 times. Um, and, you know, you've you got to clean that thing up and load it back into high vacuum to grow another 3.5 uh, film. I, I don't think that's quite as trivial um, as, as, as Alta um, would, would like to believe. Nonetheless, it's incredibly exciting. I mean, the energy problem is really important, and, and this is a beautiful example of a, of a, of a high-risk approach. Um, that could potentially has incredibly high reward. I would not be surprised at all if 10 years from now, 30% um, efficient modules um, can be made at a relatively low cost. And you know, going back to this plot, um, uh, you know, that technology potentially, uh, you know, it, it, it could give us a data point up in the 30 to 40% range, and, and maybe it could go. Um, down into at least the hundreds of dollars uh, per meter squared. Okay, so uh, to wrap up, I uh, hope I've shown you that solar is um, really, really taking off. The silicon industry is doing great. First Solar is um, uh, doing spectacularly well with cadmium telluride, um, and there are many other technologies um, on the way. Uh, silicon certainly has the lead right now, um, but it's really hard to tell uh, which technology is going to be the leader, you know, 10 years from now, uh, 20 years from now. And uh, I think as the industry gets larger, uh, it'll just be more and more um, interesting uh, with time. Okay, so with that, um, I think we have uh, at least 25 minutes, and uh, I would be happy to answer your questions. It's not working. Testing. My name is Ed Beardsworth, my energy technology advisors. Uh, could you comment on quantum dot solar? Um, well, there are a lot of third generation technologies that um, don't even come close uh, to generating a few percent efficiency. Um, and, you know, there's, there's, uh, there's multiple exciton generation, there's so-called hot carrier devices, there are intermediate band gap devices, all of which um, use uh, uh, quantum dots. And, um, you know, like multiple exciton generation, for example, only occurs a tiny fraction of the time, and it works for photons that have about three electron volts of energy. Um, and there's just a tiny amount of solar energy in that part of the spectrum. And um, it just doesn't look that promising. I, I, I don't know anyone who works for a solar company who's in any way concerned that someday they're going to be put out of business uh, by a company that, that uses um, multiple exciton generation. Um, Ted Sargent, for example, um, up in Toronto, uses more of a thin film approach. Um, there's, there's nothing to beat the shockley Quiser limit, but puts down the quantum dots and, uh, and, and just makes a film out of them and you know, gets 7% uh, 
Um, and then I guess, you know, nanosolar, they're not using quantum dots, but they're printing nanoparticles and fusing them uh, together and, and getting over 16% uh, percent efficiency. So that, you know, a little bit of what's going on with, uh, with quantum dots. <coughs> Uh, Rob Brown, Colorado School of Mines. Uh, I was wondering if you could just take a minute to explain the uh, difference between the thermodynamic limit and the shockley quiser limit. Mm -hmm. So the, uh, the thermodynamic limit is going to be a lot higher than the, the shockley quiser um, limit. Um, I mean, ultimately, one of the limits is that... Uh, uh, you, the sun is one black body and your solar cell is the other and uh, the solar cell has to radiate uh, some power back to the sun and, and um, I think that's one of the limits. Honestly, uh, I don't spend a whole lot of time worrying about the thermodynamic limits up around 70 or 80 percent uh, when we're not you know, anywhere, anywhere near that. I worry more about the practical limits. Um, but that I think it, that would be ultimately one of one of the limits, and as as we clearly see, there are strategies to go over the Shockley Quiser limit, which was for only one band gap, and so you just use multiple band gaps, and now you can do way better. And you know, in theory, by breaking the solar spectrum up into smaller and smaller slices, um, so that your carriers get excited just to the band edge and not past it you could, um, I think you can do like over 60%. I mean, practically it's gonna, you know, uh, you can't really stack 10. I don't, I don't think we're ever gonna see people tacking, uh, stacking 10 layers. Um, but I, I do think the day will come when uh, four junction cells will break 50% efficiency. We've installed a number of commercial and experimental solar farms and encouraged by the PV cost coming down. Mm -hmm. But now the balance of systems is the dominant cost. Do you have any insights in how balance of system costs can be reduced over time? Um, yeah, I mean, it, it, the balance of systems isn't uh, you know, exactly where I work. Um, but some of the things I see happening in the industry is uh, the modules are getting larger, and so, uh, the, the, the installers can put fewer of them in, and that means fewer uh, mounts, fewer clamps. Um, just at, with economies of scale, uh, it'll, it'll be cheaper. Uh, they're, they're just, the, the, the whole process for putting them in will be cheaper. Um, you know, Solar City um, is one of the nearby installers, and they're really smart about how they install it. They go to a neighborhood and if a certain number of people in that neighborhood agree to install at the same time, they get a discount. And so they're able to kind of bring in their vans and you know, get everything they need and knock out a bunch of houses. Of course, it's even better to install solar in a neighborhood when it's being built before um, you've put the walls and you can still run wires inside the framing. And it's even better to be up on the commercial rooftops um, and, and so, uh, you know, it, it's not the kind of high-tech stuff we do here at the university, but um, there is a similar curve where the costs just keep coming down uh, for, the, for the balance of systems. And, and just as people are always surprised by how silicon finds a way to get cheaper, I think people are consistently surprised by how much cheaper the um, installations, you know, get as well. And then anytime you have an efficiency improvement, um, you know, it, it, it does also translate to a balance of systems improvement as well. Do you have a, uh, a feeling about um, building integrated PV, uh, things like solar shingles, solar facades, and the, the concept of PV enmeshed into everyday life, like, you know, uh, uh, urban furniture and everyday objects. Yeah, so a lot of people are excited about building it right in, um, particularly into to roofing material. Um, and the idea being that if you're going to have to send people up on the roof to cover it with something, 
um, if it's a solar cell, then there's no additional cost uh, for having, having those people there. Although, you know, you're wiring them together is a little harder than doing shingles. Um, although on, in some cases, it would be huge rolls. It wouldn't actually be um, shingles. Um, you know, other people talk about putting them in certain kinds of windows. Um, a, lot, a lot of times uh, people put metal on the window to cut about half the light um, to reduce glare in the office and to give some, some privacy. And, you know, why not just absorb that light and, and, and generate um, current? Um, some of these things to be enabled, we need really high quality, flexible encapsulation material. And I would argue we're not quite there. You know, the, the cost is higher. It, it, it more than doubles the cost of the module um, when, you, when you do that. I've certainly seen prototypes, um, but, but right now it's a bit more expensive. Um, but it would, you know, it would definitely be exciting and, and certainly some of the big chemical companies are working hard on um, <coughs> flexible encapsulation materials. Yeah, so he's, he's asking how low the uh, cost of organic solar is, is going uh, to go. And, you know, it's hard to say. I mean, we don't know where we're going to get the um, efficiency. Uh, we're, we would need, you know, we, we would have to get the efficiency up to 15%. Uh, um, I do think the deposition will be very cheap. Um, the printing will be extremely fast. And so one machine will have an enormous uh, throughput. Um, the, the cost of the molecules would need to, to come down. Like the fullerenes are expensive. And Alan Sullinger's talk tomorrow will be about uh, looking for replacements um, for, the, for the fullerene. Um, but you know, what, we're, what we're targeting is down in the 30 to 50 cent per watt. And that would be including a substrate. Um, it would be, uh, well, I guess it's more complicated if you're stacking it on silicon. Your, your, volt, your, your power isn't going to be as high because you're only going to get a part of the spectrum, but your costs are also going to be lower. Um, it's kind of, a, kind of a different proposition when it's only half of the um, solar cell. Uh, these, uh, some of these cells have been out there for a long, long time. What's the experience with durability, degradation of efficiency versus time? And are, are all these going to be about the same in terms of that degradation? Are some more sensitive uh, than others? Uh, well, I want to <laughs> start by saying as someone who works on future generation technologies, I'm, I'm not an expert on the subject of how um, cells have done in the field, but what I have heard is that silicon is remarkably stable. Um, there are cases where people have taken it out of the field after 25 years, it was working well, or there's some cases it failed and they um, took the electrodes off and put fresh ones on and it was pretty much as good as new. Um, silicon is definitely, you know, proven. There is concern, you know, for both CADTEL and SIGs and I hear varying opinions. I hear people tell me that SIGs is going to be a real problem, and I hear other people tell me, of course they work for SIGs companies, that, uh, that it's not going to be a problem. Um, and as an, you know, someone who doesn't work on it myself, it's hard, hard for me to know. And you know, we've not seen SIGs in the field for, for 20 years. Um, and then you know, the newer generation, um, yeah, with, or, you know, with, with, with polymer cells, uh, it's definitely going to be more of a challenge than with those other um, technologies. And, uh, you know, we're, we're with some polymers, we see seven years. I showed you one example is 40. Um, but that's not in the, in the field. And in the field, the temperature cycles up and down, and you can get delamination. Um, so it's, you know, it's still, still too early um, for, for us to know how well those materials are going to be. <clears throat> Bob Tatum from Civil and Environmental Engineering. You've mentioned several examples of technology transfer from microelectronics, semiconductor. Do you see more potential for that in the future? 
So, uh, you know, there, there are, there's a company called AQT that is trying to sputter uh, SIGs, and their approach is to use equipment that was built for something else, and their idea being that, um, yeah, that their R&D costs for developing the equipment will be lower. Um, you almost could call Nanosolar and Miasole um, tool companies because they're building equipment that is unique for depositing SIGs and, and um, it certainly helps them that there had been other roll-to-roll -roll coding industries, but making printing SIG solar cells and making potato chip bags are two very um, different things. Um, you know, maybe another way to think about it, I mean, um, it won't be long before the solar industry is larger than the computer industry. And, you know, I think more and more, if you want to get the ultimate um, low, you know, the ultimate um, dollar per watt performance, everything really has to be specialized for solar. Um, and, and, you know, one of the transitions we've seen is uh, the industry used to use scrap silicon from the computer industry, then they ran out of scraps, then they used silicon that um, was made for computers, and then they said, well, actually, computers require more pure silicon than we really need. If we dropped the purity a little bit, we could lower the cost, um, and, and our performance to cost ratio would be a little bit higher, and so they did. So, you know, I, I think more and more um, it'll, it will branch off from the electronics industry. And, you know, there wasn't SIGs and CADTEL, you know, they're, they're only used for solar. They're, they're, there's no computer application um, for those materials. And, you know, multi-junction is getting more novel. And, and, you know, what I showed you from Alta devices, um, I, mean, I mean, don't get me wrong, the people who are doing that, um, you know, they used to make 3.5 lasers and stuff like that. Um, it's not <coughs> like they, they came from nowhere. Um, but more and more stuff needs to be customized for the solar industry. Hi, Mark Lefebvre from Samsung. Um, now, organic uh, photovoltaics, on an organic chemistry point of view, many of those molecules look very complicated. Mm -hmm. And I don't think they're going to be one-step um, syntheses. Are they really going to be that cheap? Could you say anything about how simple those molecules are to make? Because they seem to be getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. Yes, some of the polymers used in organic solar cells are very straightforward, uh, like Regio regular poly 3 hexylthiophene uh, <laughs> Plextronics makes that in large quantities at a pretty low cost. And some of the molecules with um, names that I can neither remember nor pronounce um, are, are made in 12-step uh, processes uh, with some low yields, and, uh, and, and they would be very expensive. Um, so, you know, it's hard, it's hard to tell if uh, we can find molecules that give us the performance, uh, the low cost, and the lifetime. You know, we, all three, you gotta, you gotta have all three uh, to, to be competitive. Um, those thio, uh, thiocyanines, um, thalocyanines, um, they're, they're pretty cheap. Um, they, like copper thalocyanine can be a dollar per gram. Um, it perf it, so it, that's an example of something that does perform well. Um, that can be made at low cost and is also um, durable. Uh, you brought up the thalocyanines. Um, uh, can, could you say anything about the, uh, the dye-sensitized solar cells? Uh, maybe compare them to the organic. Um, is there a future for them? Sure, and I, I, uh, I had to make some hard decisions about um, what I could include and what I couldn't. I really wanted to keep my remarks at an hour. Um, if I'd had uh, five more minutes, I would have talked about disensitized solar cells. Um, Michael Gratzel will have a paper coming out very soon uh, reporting a new world record at 12.3% efficiency. 
Um, he has switched from an electrolyte based on iodide to one based on cobalt complexes and was able to uh, raise the voltage up to a, to a volt. And uh, it used to be that uh, people were uh, stuck with ruthenium dyes and uh, now they've moved to a new family of uh, donor pi acceptor dyes and uh, they're getting better performance and it gives the chemist a whole new sandbox to play in. And um, after static efficiencies for a while, I think we're um, at the beginning of a period where the efficiencies are going to be rising rapidly again. Um, plasmonics are being used to improve light harvesting. Um, so so a, lot, a lot has been happening even in just the last year in um, dye-sensitized um, uh, solar cells. I have a perspective that will come out in science um, that will accompany Gratzel's uh, world record announcement. Um, so, so yeah, I think, I, think, um, I, th I think things are also pretty exciting right now for dye-sensitized solar cells. Now, they would be printable as well, right? That's, that's correct. And they're getting yeah. away from iodine. Yeah, yeah. And, and with, with, with cobalt, it's still a liquid, and some people think that's fine. You can package liquids. Other people are worried about that. Um, you know, the solid state cells are rising rapidly too, and, and they were 5% a couple of years ago, and now um, they're at 7.5%. And uh, I've talked to several large chemical companies that are making solid state uh, dye, dye cells. Um, so, so uh, and, and yeah, a lot, a lot of the comments there would be similar to the ones that I made for organic uh, solar cells. And could you say anything about the relative durability? I, uh, I don't know as much. Um, I, I personally uh, measure the lifetime of polymer cells. I, um, I don't know quite as much. Um, I, I'm under the impression that they're uh, reasonably uh, stable, they're, they're lasting several years. Um, but yeah, I, don't, I can't give a solid answer on the lifetime of dye cells. I think we ought to thank Mike very much. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.